This I did in 77 or 78. I don't remember. 78. Yeah. It's, it's really time consuming. So are these clients that are coming to you? No, no. I, well, my clan was a, a weekly magazine in, in Belgium. Mm. Belgium and France. And they let me, they say, do whatever you want. Really? So I say, well, it would be nice to, to do something with a, with a car. I struggled with the, the, the blades. <laughs> it was done okay. Mm -hmm. Then I said, maybe I can do better. And finally, I, I left it. Away. <laughs> but in the book, it came out differently. Yeah. I'm going to introduce you quickly. Uh, hey everybody, this is Peter Hahn and I'm with John Luke and this is John Luke's book under Peckett Publishing. You guys want to check it out. It's on, I believe on Amazon, right? Can you get on Amazon? Yeah, okay. Amazon, uh, uh, everywhere. Yeah, John Luke, big in cockpits. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just here to chat with you, have a beer and drink and take a look at some of your work and ask you some basic questions and maybe I can hold up some of your pieces too mm -hmm. and kind of introduce it. Uh, if you don't mind, John Luke, can you maybe like talk a little bit about your history? Maybe just how you began getting into this kind of field, um, working in aviation, and also maybe just where you came from. Well, I was born in Belgium, thirty-nine. Uh, the war just—it started in forty. A few months later, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize it until uh, later, in, like in forty-three, forty-four. Yeah where they were heavy bombing and uh, lots of American planes, uh, mostly Americans, daytime, mm. B-17, B-24. At night, uh, the British Royal Air Force, when they were bombing at night. Uh, I don't remember, don't remember much about uh, the German. Uh, um, that's... <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's <a> time. <laughs> but I remember everything about the British, uh, the American, and the Canadians yeah. coming in Brussels. Mm. And uh, first time I saw a jeep, uh, it was in front of my grandmother's place. Mm. And uh, she said, "We have Americans at home." And there were three GIs in the in the parlor, and they were drinking water because we had nothing else to offer. <laughs> and one of them, Jimmy, took me on his lap and uh, gave me some mushy bar yeah. and and chewing gum, and, <laughs> and then they took me around the block in the jeep, and mm. that was it. I say, when I grow up, I want to be an American. I want to have a jeep. So, mm. took me probably forty-five years to realize those dreams, but uh, I'm an American, I have my Jeep, you can see it here. Yeah, awesome. And uh, it's a 1942 Ford, it's a Willis design, but made by Ford. And I start doing the comic strip about the history of the Jeep, so that's one of my multiple projects. Mm, excellent. Uh, when it comes to aviation, of course, uh, being bombed every day, uh, you realize that uh, there's something big up there. And uh, when the war was over in '45, uh, the the American and the, the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Army Air Force, and the Royal Air Force uh, presented uh, their planes in the park in Brussels. So that's where I saw my first Spitfire, my first Mustang. Wow! And uh, no B-17 because they were too big for the park. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> I say I want to draw those. So I start drawing those, but of course. Uh, I wouldn't sell anything today uh, <laughs> based on that, but then I want to be to be an artist. But my mother said, "No, no, I want you to be an architect." Mm. 
Mm. And I am zilch in mathematics, so yeah. that was, I didn't, really didn't like it. So we, we didn't agree on that. And finally, the, as I didn't request, uh, how do you say, I don't know how do you say, a postponement of my military service, uh, suddenly I got a letter inviting me to join the Belgian army. I see. And oh, uh, luckily, uh, they noticed that I, I'd like to draw, so they put me in the in the staff of the army army magazine, and mm -hmm. I just learned by myself because I had a printer. Uh, nobody was really telling me what to do, so mm -hmm. I could do what I wanted. And uh, I didn't join the air force. I was in the the army, uh, the land army, and. I didn't join the Air Force because I see I am going to be sick seeing the plane and not being a pilot. Mm. I could never be a pilot. My sight was not good enough. I, I was zero in mathematics, uh, <laughs> not too good in foreign language. So that was it. I was in in the, mm. the Belgian Army, but I was in the studio, the magazine studio, and they were printing at the same plant as one of the, the well-known uh, European comic strip, uh, Tintin. Mm. And so the people at Tintin saw what I was doing and they say, when he's done with his service, send it to us. So yeah. I went and I got a job in the studio and I was doing the menial thing like mm. uh, erasing yeah. things, uh, tracing frames <laughs> and things. But I met all the great Names in uh, European cartooning and comics. Right? <laughs> Going back to the warriors and the yeah. bombing, mm -hmm. uh, the German of course uh, shooting all the American and wild and English plane flying over. And my my greatest pleasure was to go after the the alert on the roof of the house and pick up the the flag fragments. Uh, from the rain gutter, so mm. I, I, oh, over wow. the years I kept some. It's amazing. And you you could hear them uh, Just falling on the roof on yeah. the tiles, you know, clack, 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 clack. Those flag pieces. Wow. <laughs> How long have you kept these now? Well, since 1943. Oh, my gosh, wow. Was that common with like kids around you? Did you have friends? Yes, that yeah, yeah. Uh, the next day at school, we would yeah. compare what we got, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, oh, a bigger one, uh, small ones, yeah. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, history-wise, you were obviously getting into art by yourself, and you were interested in drawing and sketching, and you learned on your own. Uh, and so professionally you started getting into more like aviation, but where was the application of this? Like what would it be used for, per se? Uh, like if we have an illustration of one of these sketches we're looking at, or drawings that we're looking at right now, what would something like this be used for? Well, um, when I was working at the Tintin studio, I was approached by the competition that was Spiro Dupuy. Mm. I read the, the other bigger magazine in Europe, and. Uh, they say, if you come to us, uh, you can have your own uh, aviation uh, weekly, how do you say, uh, you would say a blog today. Right, right. Well, kind of like uh, your own, um, I guess, section maybe? In the yeah, paper? yeah, yeah, aviation section. Yeah. So they let me do exactly whatever I want to do. So um, that opens a lot of doors, sure. like uh, the Belgian Air Force, the mm. French Air Force. Uh, the French Navy, yeah. and they say, well, we have seen some of your work in the magazine. We mm. would like you to talk about this or that, I and uh, we are invited to. So I, I really started going up and up and up into those those yeah. things. And uh, I was on a carrier. I flew Mach 2 with the Canadian in the Starfighter. I yeah. flew the, the Voodoo. Uh, it's amazing. Everything. So and then it, yeah. oh, go ahead. people decide, hey, we would like to buy uh, a copy of it, but mm -hmm. not the one that's in the ma in the news in the magazine because yeah. the paper is not sure. good. And so I started printing some, and uh, mm. after a while, I'd sold thousands of them. And Have you ever sold originals? No, yeah. no, no. So you've kept most of your original over the yeah. many years of working. Uh, some disappeared. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like for, uh, with everybody artist to yeah. give them to a printer, and then finally, oh, we don't know where it is, oh, but geez. we'll let you know. And, right. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So we understand, you know, what you're working for and, you know, uh, where this is being applied to, but how do you go about doing something like this from the very beginning? 
Well, uh, I, I tried to take pictures, yeah. uh, like a, a puzzle of pictures of a cockpit, mm -hmm. put them together, and and then I realized what well, doesn't work. The perspective yeah. is not all right. Uh, it doesn't connect on the on the edges. Um, and we have a so sketch I, over here too. So I decided to, to do a sketch first. And this is a sketch. So late, in later years, when I was working, uh, living in America, yeah. I worked for Air France, and uh, Air France was also handling UTA. Mm -hmm. And one day, there was a UTA plane stuck at uh, LAX for four or five hours. Mm. And I was in charge of keeping an eye on what was happening in the plane. Yeah. So I, s I decided to do the sketch. I tried to do a sketch and to do a cockpit rendition later. Yeah. So, but I had no, no paper, nothing much except a, a ballpoint. So wow. I started with. I took some papers in the plane, in the cockpit, <laughs> yeah. I put them together, and uh, I did the basic sketch. So from that sketch like that, yeah. uh, I do a, line, a, a rough line drawing after, mm -hmm. and then I take pictures when, when possible, yeah. or look for flight manuals right. to put the instrument uh, where they should be and the way they should, they should look. Mm -hmm. so, so this yeah. would be about maybe an hour or less on a sketch like the this? The sketch? Yeah. I think it was about looking for the paper too about two hours yeah, yeah yeah and this is you sitting in the cockpit right in front of it just gathering I your always sit where the captain sits yeah okay. or if it's a fighter plate right uh, where the pilot sits exactly to give the feeling that the whole thing is the i would say the secret is in the perspective of course it's yeah. you feel like mm -hmm. and some people when when they saw some of my first case you see Oh no, that's wrong. Wrong. The thing is not like that. Yeah. When I say, if you sit yeah. in the captain's seat, that's the way you will see it. Exactly. And then they went and they say, yeah, you are right. <laughs> yeah, I actually want to ask you about that too. I feel many people out there who see your work, especially cockpit work, would be very curious. Perspective-wise, how did you train your eye for something like this? Is it something natural that you saw, or was it something you kind of trained through perspective uh, methods and, and tutorials that you went into? But it sounds like you kind of learned it on your own as you're doing. Yeah, I just draw what I see. Yeah, and uh, I try not to move my my head too much. Mm. I just go like this, yeah. like this. Yeah. But uh, I realize what I'm doing while I'm drawing is the inside of a half a sphere. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. That's and interesting. And then you try to, when Wrap you draw, to flatten it. Yeah. And I think that was happened. That it happened with uh, maps, you know. Right, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's incredibly complex. I mean, it sounds easy for you to the, describe that, and I can visualize it. The idea that you see this uh, cockpit like a spherical form, and you're able to map it out and then flatten it at a two-dimensional piece of paper. I can visualize it, but I can honestly tell you that even for me, that will be incredibly difficult to do. <laughs> As a sketch, uh, I think I will be able to plan a lot of things out. Um, and I think I would conform to a lot of the classical methods of perspective, like, you know, where are my vanishing points and what point are these going into? But seeing it almost like a three-dimensional spherical form was something I don't think I would even think of, actually. So it's funny because that really, is, even right now, kind of lets me know that sometimes uh, methods in classes can sometimes train your eye to look only in a specific way but because you didn't do that you had to kind of problem solve it on your own so you kind of created your own method to get a, a view of it almost what makes sense to you in a way um, so it's kind of interesting to hear that because if I was to sit in this cockpit and look at it in more of a classical sense of like you know where all my horizon lines and vanishing points all that stuff is I may not be able to capture it in the way that you would because I wouldn't consider a lot of the curvature that would be going in there, too. Um, I think a lot of students that might be hearing something like this as well would probably find that uh, interesting to hear. Where education and self-education is, is yeah. kind of like an interesting, always a dilemma, uh, even right now. Because educationally, you know, I've been teaching Art Center for nine years at the moment. And the cost of education is going so high at the, at the certain yeah. moment. So, you know, many students are looking for ways to continue to self-educate and, and find experience. 
So to hear someone like you who has hasn't really gone through a formal, I guess, kind of university education, uh, and it's mostly done through experience and natural kind of inclination, uh, I think is fascinating. I mean, do you have any thoughts on like education like right now? If you had like a, a son that was interested in art, and he said, "I want to go to art center." Would you back him on that, or would you be like, mm, consider maybe something else? <laughs> no, I did. You did. My daughter yeah. Caroline, right? Oh, daughter Caroline, yeah. uh, went to the, to uh, the art center, right, right, yeah. and I was amazed by she learned there, mm. and the the amount of work she was asked yeah. for. I remember one day she said, "Oh, I have to do a hundred fifty sketches yeah. for tomorrow night." Yeah. I said, "What?" <laughs> and she did, and she she's really talented, yeah. and I wish I would have gone through that too. But okay, anyway, it's a, yeah. it was not possible. Yeah. I was the, in in a way the the problem with me was that. I didn't go to art school, mm -hmm. but I earned money right away yeah. doing my stuff. Yeah. And then once you are making your life, you say, well, uh, what should I go to school now or not? Sure. And I decide not to, and yeah. I just kept doing my stuff. And finally, I end up in av aviation, mm -hmm. uh, being a, a sta not a station manager, but operation manager at Los Angeles mm -hmm. for FM, so. I see. I, I saw that you pulled out a couple of these small little sketches too, which I really like seeing because you know when people see your work, let's say online or through prints, they normally see like the really massive, big kind of cockpit illustrations, which are always uh, eye drop, uh, amazing just yeah. to kind of. I like to do to. cartooning plus. Yeah, but friends. like seeing these small things are just really fun to see too. I so guess. this is a friend of mine who was commander, a uh, navy commander, yeah. uh, uh, and pilot. He flew the F-18, and uh, he has a private uh, steerman, so <laughs> I combined both. Uh, he liked it. I like it. That's too. amazing. And again, I like seeing these because it shows me that you're also well versed, not only doing just one type of drawing. I mean, you you can draw airplanes from the inside, but also obviously from the outside. Uh, you're able to do caricature, but you've also done like comics as well too. Yes, yeah. oh, it's and, in my studio. That, no, it's fantastic that you know to hear the the different areas that you've kind of um, gone into using your your I guess skill sets that you built over time. Um, I guess other questions building off of the way you kind of approach some of these cockpits. You sketch them, you'll take photographs, you gather information and data. How much time do you think you spend on actually illustrating the final piece, would you say? Six months. Six months. But I do other things too. Of course. So it's a combination of multiple Just uh, taking the kids to school, yeah. or the grandkids to school, or uh, <laughs> whatever. So you're talking about day-to-day -day living too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, sometimes my wife complains, she says, oh, I think I married a monk, you know, <laughs> nothing, you cannot hear anything, I don't know if you are there, in fact you are there. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and of course, in six months period, you're, you're probably working on it, are you working on it daily, or is it more like off no, and on? No, or? when I feel like when it. you feel like yeah, it. Yeah, sometimes I'm fed up with it. Yeah. And I say, oh, I'll do something, and that's why I start two or three projects at the same, same time, because yeah. you, you you move around different right, things. Right. Yeah. Do you actually ever document actually how many hours it does take for one piece? So if you were to like no. bring it all down, mm -hmm. how much time it would take? Because in a six months period, if you're working on it off and on, um, it could be upwards of probably what, 60 hours maybe, 40, 60 hours or more potentially? A week? Uh, no, just on a single piece. 60, totally. yeah, 60 totally. hours? Yeah, is it more than no, that? No, more, more yeah. than that, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting to hear that because I think from my generation and the kids that are working today, the, the amount of patience it would take to focus on something like that would probably be incredibly difficult too. A lot of my pieces that I create for just even basic sketches to you know pieces for clients or professional work, you know, we're only spending maybe three, four hours on some of these things. So they hear that you might be going, you know, 200, 300 hours plus on some of these illustrations, you know, sound to me like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's almost impossible sounding. Yeah. I don't regret it because yeah. I think when it's done, it's a piece of history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was a plane like it was 40 years ago mm -hmm. or the way it, was, it is today, but will not be the same tomorrow. Right. Yeah. And some, I remember, the best test for me is when the drawing is done. I show it to pilots, mm. and they say, 
Yeah, I feel like I'm in my plane. <laughs> and they never felt like that with uh, photos and this and that. So yeah, amazing. So and I remember one pilot was also he was an architect, but also a pilot. And he wanted to do a cockpit rendition of the Concorde. And yes. uh, he asked me, how do you do that? And I say, I just do a sketch first. Wow. And then he tried, it didn't work. And then all his colleagues told me, well, he went in a plane with a, a tape measure things, yeah. and measure angles, yeah. this, that, dun, yeah. dun, dun, and never, never made it. Mm. So, yeah, this is the hurricane. Yeah. What year was this when you made this piece? Well, it's not finished. I'm it's still not, working, still working on, it. on it. Yeah. <laughs> when did you start it? Uh, probably four years ago. Yeah. So there are some pieces that you'll probably start, kind of touch, and then move yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, the else. P38 is one. The, yeah. the Messerschmitt is another one. The mm. the use uh, spruce goose yeah. is another one. So. so as a piece you're working on, like right now. Uh, is this for then yourself, or is it still working with your publisher in Belgium, or are you still working with someone else? No, the magazine itself has sort of collapsed yeah. uh, over 40 years yeah. because uh, kids are not really buying comics. Sure, I mean, the weekly comics anymore, it's yeah. all uh, digital or mm -hmm, computers. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so then this is mostly for you, for yourself then? Yeah, but yeah. it's it, like I show you the calendar. Mm -hmm. Well, it oh, no. was not planned as a calendar. Exactly. But, so there's yeah. potential clients that might yeah, be. Yeah, there's always somebody who will, yeah. who will say, oh, I'm interested. Right. So if we do an a English version of the cockpit book, those will be in it. Of too. course. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, it's amazing. So um, beyond the time, the experience, where you, you know, how you trained, what are some of the tools that you will use to you know, finish a piece like this? Is it only, obviously, there's probably some pencil lay-in. Uh, what kind of like pens do you like to use for this one? Obviously, a lot of students like to ask this for many professionals. You know, what are some of the tools? The only, only pen I use is the the Rapidograph. The Rapidographs. Corino, yeah, Rapidograph, yeah, yeah. whatever. Has it been like your go-to pen, or have you explored other tools yourself? Well, I stopped uh, 50 years ago with uh, just a regular pen yeah. that you dig. You dip in ink, yeah, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. that was a messy affair. Uh, <laughs> then somebody said, no, 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 try this, so I tried the Rapidograph, and I said, wow, that's marvelous. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then the, for the the circles, I used to do them by hand, or mm -hmm. the ellipse. Wow, and then somebody really? said, well, architect used this and that. So, yeah, yeah I, I discovered a few things that I, I would have learned in one week mm -hmm. at school, but took me <laughs> months and years. So that's the other thing about education, huh? Where you start to pick up things a little bit slower over time, but you probably would then appreciate those things more than anything else because it's a discovery that you're making that took a while to get there, but the amount of effort it took you to even just accomplish without those tools to get what you needed requires then a lot of focus and a lot of you know work uh, to get that quality up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ellipse and the, the circles. Ellipse. Yeah. yeah. Trouble. <laughs> ellipses are, in, in my class, uh, so I teach a class that's only based on sketching. So ellipses are like the, the trouble spots for most people, especially freehand, of course. I always tell students, you know, you're not machines. You cannot draw a perfect circle. But we do exercises to get closer and closer to the accuracy so we can control our pens to get there. Uh, but of course, with something like this, I think the tools would definitely be necessary because it's all about the accuracy of that cockpit. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. But you also use other methods too, like you'll do uh, illustrations or sketches of like instrument panels or logos separately, and then you'll bring them in there by scaling it down. By yeah, that's, it. that's something I started doing uh, when I got my computer, hmm. and I, I realized that I could do the lettering and uh, all the, the gauges the, uh, uh, faster with yeah, that. Yeah. Before that, I used to have transfers. Mm -hmm. And that was time killing too, you know. <laughs> and then you never found it was hard to find the right size, the right type, and this and that. Yeah. yeah. So amazing. Yeah. Now what I do now, trying to go a little faster, yeah. I do separate pieces and then I put them together on the computer. Right, I see. Yeah. Amazing. So is this something you want to just continue to do for the rest of your life? I mean, is there any other plans taking your art anywhere else? Well, uh, I have so many projects that yeah. I think I should live at least until 120. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I hope so. I really do. 
You know, I, I was really happy to uh, you know discover not only just your work because I had actually seen it. Uh, well, the first time, well, just a little bit of history for people also that we met at Chino last year, yeah, uh, 2018, two years, ago. two years ago, yeah, already, uh, and. I had seen your work many, many years beforehand because I used to go to Chino Air Museum and see these massive posters of these cockpits. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so I would show my students, you know, this is an amazing illustration, all that kind of stuff. But I just never knew who you were, so it was such a surprise to actually meet you at Chino and be able to have a dialogue and continue our dialogue afterwards too. Um, so I think this kind of like discovery, I've been sharing it a lot online where. I think it's important to obviously support the youth and the the younger students and the ed you know, education side of things to get them where they want to go. But I also feel that it's very very important to make sure we recognize you know people like you who invested your life span into something like this. And many of the younger generation people are not aware, I think, of of the dedication that people have made in, before them. Uh, right now, the popular trends of digital art and you know video games and movies and comics are such a big thing. You know, but a lot of that stuff, I think, uh, you know, people get lost into the popularity and the trends of stuff and forget sometimes the history of where someone like you may have kind of stepped in, even though it's not necessarily connected directly to what entertainment is, but the skill sets, you know, and, and where you could apply this is just absolutely amazing to me. So that's why I've been trying to, like, you know, build a strong uh, connection as much as possible. So I hope that you will live to 120. <laughs> You'll keep working as much as you can. Um, but no, thank you for sharing your work. Uh, I'll probably end up doing some extra little bit of roles with you and just kind of take a little closer look at some of the work. So. Yeah. Peter did lightning with my Jeep, of course. And uh, I tried to give uh, an perspective that you cannot get with a camera. People might say, oh, but you can get that with a camera. But you would have to go farther, mm -hmm. and it would, the, it would be totally different. I, I know by experience. Mm -hmm. This is one you're working on right now? One of them. Oh, I have mm -hmm. three or four going. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. This I started in 74, 75, no, 76 mm -hmm. in Belgium after having been invited on a French guy. Yeah. And I, then I moved over here and I left it in my drawer. And uh, like two, three years ago, I started again. And uh, that dream was sort of telling me, Are you going to finish me or what? <laughs> and so I decided to finish it. And it's in the it's in the book. So. Mm -hmm. and, Great plane. It yeah. was flying uh, in '76, and the Navy told me, "Hurry up, because it's going to be phased out in two years." Mm. It was phased out in '99. Wow! So. Amazing. And that's my favorite, the Mustang. Oh, it's the Mustang. Huh? Yeah. P51. Yeah. Here too, if you take a picture of the whole cockpit at once. You will not get the same perspective for all those things on the side. Yeah. This is right there at your right, this mm -hmm. is right there at your left, this is up there, this is down there. Exactly. So that's what I say, it's half a sphere yeah. flattened. Yeah. Would be easy, it would be a program like that. <laughs> it's the map, the entire thing. And that's one in progress too, the hurricane. Um, no, I do the the gauges or the dials separately, separately yeah. and I put them on later. And here again, you have all those things are right there to your mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. right there to your right. Yeah. Up, down. In fact, I call that a, a floating perspective. Floating perspective. Yeah. Whatever it means. No. That's, people <laughs> say, well, oh, you call it. I say, a floating perspective. <laughs> Have you ever flown before? Not you, as a pilot. No, you've been inside some of these airplanes, but you know. Yeah, but no, well, they let me fly it. Yeah. But uh, even Mach 2, I remember, over yeah. Germany. Uh, Mach 1, sorry. Uh, but uh, my wife, because my son-in-law is a f captain and a flight instructor, mm -hmm. and he said, I'll teach you to fly, at least go around the, f the, the field for 
one or two trips and uh, we can do that in about 10 days and my wife said if I hear that it happened I'll divorce you so <laughs> it's sort of take the incentive away <laughs> that piece of the Apollo command module yeah. I, I did they let me in so it helped a lot in fact, they, were, they thought I was sleeping in it because I was doing my sketching. It took me so long. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite the, the DC-3. Yeah, wow. C-47. And there's one anecdote about that. It's uh, the family of a, a veteran pilot of the C-47 who was in the invasion, uh, D-Day. Uh, told me they bought one one print and then they wrote they wrote late they yeah they wrote later uh, when we framed it and uh, our dad was in his bed sort of uh, he had Parkinson's and everything and and uh, we put the frame in front of him and he was suddenly he sort of woke up and said let's go let's go <laughs> so I guess my perspective did something. Wow. Perhaps re reconnect some synapses, yeah, you know? Yeah. Oops, sorry. Awesome. Made him feel like he was in the airplane again. Yeah. Gosh. And here I put my wife. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's all the stuff. Not just fighters. Yeah. Just, uh, was uh, Santos Dumo, the Brazilian. Mm inventor it's obviously that you're also actually interested in airplanes also you actually like the history of aviation you oh, like yes. the engineering aspect of it um, yeah. it's not just you enjoying drawing but that was the first supersonic the Bell X1 I took a picture in uh, during the making because I say once it's done you know you easily forget about everything yeah and I put the uh, the first uh, pilot who flew uh, with the rocket engine on, uh, he didn't go supersonic, he couldn't go legally mm. because he was not an uh, Air Force guy. So that's uh, Slick Goodlin. Mm -hmm. He was also one of the first uh, Israeli Air Force pilots in 1947. I see. Yeah, he flew Spitfire. Wow. Great. I think that's a good amount. Oh, I did some. This is a Porsche, a sport prototype, 908. Yeah. And I re I got really interested in those. This is a 9117. 917. A lot of this is also for publishing too, right? For yeah, it was Porsche published in books, but uh, now people uh, just ask me, can I have a print? So yeah. I, I do the, I sell them on the Etsy. Mm. But I, I realized when I saw those guys, I was there on the, on the racetrack, uh, coming by at 230 miles an hour. <laughs> I say, okay, there's a, not much difference between a, a fire pilot and a race car driver yeah. because you, you need the same reflex. Absolutely. So, uh, this is, uh, that's a, I reworked a sketch of the, the B-24 mm -hmm. Liberator, but uh, and I don't think I will ever finish it. But, but this is what we consider a sketch. That's a sketch, yeah. 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 Wow. And a majority of this is, you know, using pencil, uh, pen, and yeah. different tools for ellipses and straight lines. Uh, well, it's the ellipse yeah, are here. Exactly. The rest is, uh, it's not rapidograph, this is uh, what, uh, markers. Really. Yeah. Wow. How many pieces would you say you've done so far? Let's see. Uh, not many. Probably, probably 50, something 50 like that. But because of the amount of time it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, this is the other part of uh, the Apollo. Apollo 11. Okay. I don't know which one I'll show you. But I'm a little uh, lost in here. Just, um, I met uh, Milton Caniff, so he gave me some of his of his prints. Wow, that's great. 
I, that's something I really admire. Mm. I see. And figurative work like humans and people are something you've drawn as well too. No, but I'm not very familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> make a nice uh, human body, I need a ruler and a compass. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I regret that I can I didn't take uh, studies like that because my daughter did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, great. We can finish on this. This was this really helped me a lot because. My publisher in Europe printed 300,000 copies of it and it went all over the French and the, and the Dutch part of Europe and then NASA saw it and I went to see uh, Apollo 12, uh, Apollo 17, no, Apollo 16, a lift off. I met Cernan there and invited me to his ranch and so really it snowballed. Amazing. How long did this one take you? Not too long because no. uh, my publisher said, oh, we should have something for the, the space launch. Mm. Wow. Uh, and then uh, later I had it signed by the astronaut themselves. Yeah. Here, uh, Sermon said to Jean Luc, an old friend wow. who I'm proud to know. And here, in Evans. I can fly to the mood, I'll never be able to draw like you, that's a little too much, but anyway, I, I took it gladly. Is this about the largest you've gone? Yes. Have you gone bigger than this? Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 It's amazing. Thank you for sharing it with John Luke. Uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, garage. Well, that goes by to when the Americans came in, in Brussels and as I said, I got a ride in the Jeep, I yeah. got the Hershey bar, and then they would take me regularly to their PX, you know, post exchange, mm -hmm. that's a military uh, store. And I would see all those unknown product to me. And in my later years, I said, I want to sort of recreate the atmosphere of the PX. Of course, it's very modest, but uh, all the product of the de those days, and then I decided to, I got so many ma magazines from World War II, I decided to display them in a way that's uh, not too ordinary. And I saw a new stand in New York, I took some measure pictures and built a, a smaller version of it. And uh, see all the, the magazines, mm -hmm. uh, wartime, the covers are... Yeah. On, and then the, in nine, uh, right after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. government asked all the publishers in America to put the uh, American flag, stars and stripes, on the cover of their July 1942 mm. issue. So yeah. I got a few of them there. Wow. And uh, they were 117 different ones. So Amazing. on the July 4th, or the week of July 4, 1942, all the newsstands were just covered with flags. Um, so the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about was your your next steps. You know, obviously you're working on a couple of additional projects, and I'm hoping that I'm going to try to work with you this year to see if we can get your work up in a gallery. So um, I hope that you're going to be open to do so. But is there anything else maybe you want to mention or, or talk about or things you might want to share for people that might be watching or for me? Uh, if not, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, what drove me is just passion. Yeah. Uh, passion for illustration and mm. aviation. Yeah. And I don't expect to get rich with that, yeah. but uh, at least uh, people who have seen it or who, who have both what I've done are uh, very pleased and uh, like I said with the old timer who mm -hmm. suddenly uh, <laughs> uh, came back to life and said let's go I say I know that I did something that's that's uh, worth something to yeah. some people yeah, yeah for sure and then historically speaking I say well that's so uh, DC3 was in wartime uh, mm -hmm. before the invasion so maybe 
50 years from now, people will not say, oh, that's how it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, the way I look at engravings from uh, the 1600s, yeah. I say, wow, that's, I can see the, pe the, the guy engraving his plate mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah. That's how I feel about your work, too, that it captures so much history, but so much technical capability that I feel that many people today, young kids, would be incapable of doing. Uh, even for myself, I don't think I would be able to achieve the level of precision and quality that you've been able to get with your illustrations. Um, and you know, I'm sure you know, all artists but to all some are, are humble. I started <laughs> like everybody else. Yeah, I exactly. couldn't do it. Yeah, I just. And that's the amazing thing about it: the, the level of dedication, like you said, passion was a huge part of it. Yeah, so I think that's it shows. That's the most. The, the more, most important ingredient is passion. Yeah. So it's so time consuming. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for joining in. This is Jean Luc. Please check out his site. He does have an Etsy, which I'll share as a link. And the book is available on Amazon. So go check him out and support Jean Luc. And hopefully, at some point this year, we're going to get him inside of a gallery show in LA. And you'll hopefully be able to see some of these originals in person. So thank you, Jean Luc. I appreciate it. Thank that. you, Peter. All right. We're good.